Hampton High School's BBC School Report. I'm Ruth. And I am Jude. We will be your presenters for today. Today we'll be covering topics such as gender equality, child obesity and discrimination. Let's commence with a report on mental health. Over to you Alice. Today at Chrysleton High School we are running a Mental Health Awareness Day that gives sixth formers the opportunity to partake in activities such as yoga, zumba, pilates and hair and makeup. The event is led by Miss St Clair and Miss Salisbury and we are very lucky today to have Miss to speak to. What is the aim of today's activities? The aim of this afternoon is to give students in the sixth form a chance to not focus on exams, not focus on stress and just take some time for themselves to relax, enjoy themselves and maybe try something different that they've not done before such as meditation or yoga. I imagine sixth formers would really value opportunities to take a break and calm down as well. So do you think events like today should be arranged more often? I do. I think in Mental Health Week each year there should be something on um, with a particular focus with mental health issues. Uh, and I also think that things should happen in the school day, such as meditation, maybe in form time, um, and a chance to focus on de-stressing activities. Along with in schools, Mental Health Awareness Days I think should be more accessible to adults also in light of recent events with, regarding mental health. So what is your opinion on the recent adult mental health cuts in the NHS? I think it's a real shame because I do believe that mental health and physical health should be viewed in the same way. I think there's a stigma against mental health that shouldn't be there and I think that the funding that is available for people with mental health issues should be equal to that of people with physical health issues. Do you think mental health should be talked about more in schools and at home? I definitely do. Like I said with the stigma, I think people feel that they can't talk about mental health issues and I think that shouldn't be the case. People should be supportive and feel confident enough to speak to parents, speak to friends and really share how they're feeling to help them get the support that they need. So how does mental health affect teenagers, especially students who are taking important exams such as A-levels? I think students put a lot of pressure on themselves and I think that is um, illuminated by the recent cases of um, students being referred to CAMS which has risen in recent years and I think that students feel that they failed if they've not got the A to C's that they need and I think that leads to feelings of worthlessness, feeling that people aren't good enough and it really shouldn't be that way. In your opinion, what is the best way at home to de-stress, particularly over exam periods? I think it's important, like I said, to take some time, even things like getting a bath, reading a book, watching a funny film, playing with your pet, all of these things have been shown to reduce um, stress and anxiety. Um, also speak to people, tell them how you feel, talk to parents, talk to your brother, your sister, your friends, um, but again just take that time to do something, live in the moment, don't worry about what's going to happen at school tomorrow or that exam that you did bad in, just focus on that time and feel happy. To finish, what do you think the three best ways of staying positive are? Surround yourself with people that make you feel good, people that make you feel happy. Take some time for yourself to do the things that you really, really love. And lastly, just don't be too hard on yourself. You're not perfect, but you're perfect in your own way and don't compare yourself to other people. Thank you very much for your time. Hello and welcome to our BBC School Report. We will be looking at today how music affects young people. Specifically, if music can negatively impact the younger generation in any way. In an attempt to find a correlation, we have gathered information with multiple sources, including a first hand account of a former musician, Simon Jones of the Verve. Um, do you feel that your position as a music teacher enables you to get a better insight into the effects of music on young teenagers? Yeah, definitely. I've uh, been teaching for 20 years now, and it's been interesting to see how children react to what I present to them in the classroom. So some students are really good with rhythm and they have a natural ability to do that which we can then explore. Uh, some students like different styles of music that we present to them and so on. And what are these effects that you've uh, Enthusiasm, it's very good for confidence building if you've got some students who aren't particularly confident in general just by doing music and by performing it and by being involved in a group it can help to build the confidence and it can also help with their enthusiasm within different areas it can also help with speech and language music has been shown to be very good to develop speech and language skills in general do you feel restricted to what content you're able to teach uh, not really we try and cover all of the different styles of music um, so classical jazz pop rock whatever um, obviously we have to keep it appropriate so if you're looking at rap music there's sometimes some inappropriate language in there which we we don't go near um, but in general we try and present them with as many different opportunities as we can. And are the effects of certain music genres on children visible to you as a teacher? Um, yes definitely some obviously music is directly linked to emotion 
and some styles of music and some types of music are going to generate different emotions in students and in me and everything else. So students get to learn about how they can create music to link to whatever emotion they're trying to put forward at the time. Thanks. Thank you. Now we have Ewan with us, a year nine pupil at Christensen High School who's a regional hurdling champion. He's here today to talk to us about the importance of a good diet. Ewan, we're doing a story about how child obesity is increasing. So what would you say about it? I'd say that it's a real problem in our country and in America, and I think it needs to be tackled quickly, um, although it, it might not, it might take a long time to tackle, and I think it's also that it's the responsibility of the children, the responsibility of the teachers, the parents, doctors, and the government all to educate people better on how to have a more healthy lifestyle. So, in your opinion, how could we tackle the problem by, say, educating people or by telling people what to eat? I think, well, as you said, educating is a key factor in solving this crisis because if we can educate children at a very young age about a good diet, um, it will be easier to maintain that because they will understand the, the complications that can be um, brought about through obesity. Anyway, many people know that you're an accomplished athlete, a hurdler. So what is your diet like teaming up to leading up to the races, competitions and general training? Well, the diet, it hasn't have to be incredibly specific, but I, I try to eat lots of vegetables and try to have lots of protein and carbohydrates for slow release energy, because um, that always helps me when I'm competing to um, have lots of energy to be able to perform well. So would you say this helps you steer, steer clear of obesity and live a healthier life? I wouldn't say it's just my diet that helps me stay away from obesity. I think it's it's also um, the amount of exercise I do because I think to solve the obesity crisis, we can't just make people's diets better. We need to be able to, we need children need to be doing more exercise than they are now because a healthy diet on its own is not going to solve the crisis. What would you say is the most important part of a healthy lifestyle? I think there's not one point of a healthy lifestyle. I think there's I think it's important to have a healthy diet and have do lots of exercise because all of those little things put together can help solve the problem. So what tips do you have for young aspiring athletes and how we can reduce the amount of obesity amongst children? I think for young children trying to get into sport it's important just to eat healthily, enjoy themselves um, and just not worry about what's going to happen in the future and trying to always looking forward trying to do certain things just train hard and it, times will come and then to help childhood obesity like i said just education and increasing the amount of exercise people do or help as you said that sport is important as well which one would you say is more important or would you say they're equal but i would say that they're both the same because if you have just a healthy diet, it will, you will lose weight, but you won't lose as much as you could if you had exercise as well. They problems go. about child obesity and how it's increasing. Would you agree that this is a matter that we should be considering, as it could be a risk to child health? I think it's really important because as you get older, you do appreciate that you get ailments, you get injuries, which, which do relate back to when you're in primary school and when, when you were young children. And if youngsters can keep as healthy and as fit as possible and eat a healthy diet, that it means that, that they'll be healthier for longer in their life. As we have many different food groups, which food groups would you say that children are lacking in their diet and they should be eating a lot more? Okay, I think they're on the board behind me and I think everybody should be aware of this and I don't know where the parents are. I know that you guys are in school. But um, these are the five food groups and... Um, I would say that the group that students like to have most of are these here, which are the, the foods with food and drinks with a lot of um, sugar and fat in them. Mm. But in actual fact, they need more of the top two, the fruits and vegetables and the carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, not too bad, but we need to get more vegetables into those types of meals. 
Students need to be eating more fruit. People think that a child's diet is their choice, but is it really, or is it more of the parent's influence? You're right, children at the age of five can't be responsible, and I believe that um, a parent's role is to bring up their child to, to be healthy, to be a good citizen, to be able to um, become a healthy adult, and therefore it's vital that the parents educate children to be able to eat properly. After some research, we found that child obesity is mostly increasing around primary school age, where almost 20% of year 6 students are obese. So should we be keeping a close eye on what, they're, on what children are eating? 20% is an awful lot, isn't it? Yeah. So, yes, I completely agree that um, we should be keeping an eye on it right from the beginning. And I don't know if you're aware that in primary schools um, there, there are um, teachers who actually go and check lunch boxes and make sure that um, the lunch boxes are, contain healthy foods. And some schools, if there's like a chocolate bar, will remove the chocolate bar because it's not healthy enough. And if you have like a school meal, you have one meal and you eat that whether you like it or not. Whereas in secondary schools, there's a lot of choice, isn't there? Yeah. And it's sometimes that choice, those choices made by students, where it, that's where it goes wrong a bit. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. So, finally, Will, how can we stop child obesity? We can clearly see that from our two interviews, many action, actions should be taken to stop the increase on child obesity. I think that children and parents must be educated about the importance of a healthy diet and what to eat. I completely agree with you and I also think that we should encourage children to do more sports and physical ed education. Thank you and back to the studio. Um, Sophie Lancaster was kicked to death on August 24, 2007 in a park in Lancashire purely for dressing in a gothic fashion. Although this was nine years ago, are hate crimes like this still going on? Nowadays, it is less common to see young people dressed in such drastically different ways to others. This could be down to shops such as Primark and New Look, which are in most high streets and are very cheap. Um, at the time of Sophie's tragic death in the mid-2000s, alternative and punk music was very popular, whereas nowadays mainstream music is all very similar, with a lot of dance and R&B. As alternative cultures are less popular, are hate crimes like Sophie still happening? We spoke to Miss Rose, a student support community communicator at our school and asked her a few questions. Do you think that hate crimes like Sophie Lancaster's are still common? I would like to think that they weren't common um, because Sophie's case was sadly so extreme that, that she died but just doing a little bit of research for, for today's interview I found that there is still a lot of hate crime out there and in fact 80% of crime they think is not reported so sadly it still does go on. And um, how do you think hate crimes among subcultures can be stopped? I think it's going to be a lot of education and tackling the intolerance that is out there and that can only be done by people learning what, what a hate crime is and more reporting. I think that's key. Just looking at the uh, websites that are available, it's really important to um, report hate crime. Who is to blame for hate crimes? I think the ignorance lack of education, lack of tolerance, that's what's to blame for hate crimes. The people who perpetrate it try to blame the victims themselves, but it's, it is only lack of tolerance and understanding that is to blame. Do you think that people nowadays are more or less accepting of difference? I think there have been huge strides in that, in terms of acceptance of gender, race, um, religion, but I think we've still got a huge, huge way to go. How do you think that people can be educated on subcultures and differences? I think education, knowing what a hate crime is, perhaps more awareness, just ourselves researching for this interview, we have found there's a lot of information out there that we didn't know about. So really the key is, I think, spreading the message and more education. Thank you. After hearing of Mr Lamberton's resignation, we asked him to share a few thoughts with us and look back over his long and successful career. Mr Lamberton, it's lovely to have you here with us. Now I know that you have been head teacher at Christleton High School for 14 years, so there must have been some very interesting experiences. What has been your highlight of your career? I think my highlight is a daily one, which is seeing students come into school 
mostly with a smile on their face, students wanting to come to school and that's what I get up for and I, that's been the biggest pleasure really. That must be a very fulfilling feeling for you. But I'm aware that Ofsted um, graded the school as outstanding on their last visit, but is there anything that you would have done differently? During the inspection or? Yes. Yeah. Uh, not during the inspection, an outstanding, I, we're very proud that we've got that grading, but to me that's a start, not an end. Outstanding just simply means you've got a, a really strong desire to get better, to serve children, to get better results, to make the facilities better, and to constantly improve and learn. Uh, so it was very flattering to have it, but I regard it as, as a starting point. Catch a moment, tell me mum. She was pleased as well, she's 85. Uh, we were all pleased and then we need to get on with the business of making our school better. Was there any particular moral that you have lived by when making taxing decisions for the school? Students first, always, about everything. Very good. Has there ever been an occasion where you were very unsure as to what decision you should make? Lots of times, most days to be honest, um, because I think if we're sure in life we we can become arrogant, we think we know the answer. Sometimes we do and sometimes we don't, but if you're sure, you close your mind to other uh, opportunities and ideas. And uh, there have been a lot of things I've been unsure of. Some, some horrible things have happened in school. We've had students who've died and I haven't known how to deal with that. And we've had to come together as a community and there have been some fantastic things where we could have done things better still. So uh, being unsure is, uh, I think, is a strength as long as you know to go and ask for help. Yeah. Now, I'm sure you've worked with hundreds of people throughout your career as a teacher and as a, as a head teacher, but is there anything that you'd like to say to them, whether that be a positive thing or a suggestion for improvement? To the young people? Not necessarily, to, to, to other anyone, colleagues. Yeah. I think to everybody is, is live your life properly, uh, be a decent person, have lots of fun and a bit of mischief and keep learning and realise that you never know everything and you can always learn and just make the most of your life because life is precious and we see people whose lives are cut short, um, all the things they miss out on. It's now it is unfortunate Mr Lamberton that you are resigning as head teacher of this school but I'm sure somebody experienced and full of new ideas is going to take your place. So is there anything that you'd like to say to that person that's going to continue your good work? Just come into school, have a look with open eyes at everything that's there and make it all better. <laughs> if you could sum your time up at Christleton in three words, what would that be? Uh, happy, hardworking and courteous. School Which motto. is our school it's motto. motto. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very thank much you very for your much. time. We greatly appreciate it and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. You. Hello, I'm Taryn. And I'm Alex. And I'm going to be asking some questions about YouTubers. How do you feel that YouTubers are impacting today's society? Well, they're impacting today's society because they're becoming relatively celebrities. They're a really kind of, what some would say, easy medium. So people would um, say that their job's not necessarily real, but so and they find the odd that they're getting all the success. But I feel like they're working their way into big culture and media, and I think they've become a big part of young people's lives. Do you think YouTube will improve our graphs? Well, I think um, I personally think if we keep going at the rate we're at, like YouTube's trying to turn into Spotify with their YouTube Red, and also um, trying. Also, I feel like quite a lot of YouTubers are going to be transitioning into television, which is, I feel like when YouTubers start to transition into television, that is when YouTube will fall. Um, how are YouTubers impacting you personally and your friends? Personally, um, all of my friends watch the same um, YouTubers. It's just like watching the same TV show. It gives us a talking point. It gives us inside jokes. And it gives us something to do. And it's also something we're interested in. And it gives other people a medium to ha have things in common with, which is nice. Would you ever feel like you could become a YouTuber? Personally, no. 
Um, I don't think I would become a YouTuber, probably just because it takes a very long time to get where the big ones are, and also you have a lot of people that, a lot of big business people that like to pick on the YouTubers and stuff, but I don't think I would do it, but I'm pretty sure I would encourage other people to do it. From everybody in the studio, we hope you enjoyed our BBC School Report. Thank you and goodbye.